The president wants to spy on 200 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document, which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America's all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Saturday night, the nation was riveted by a small courtroom in Seminole, Florida. Everyone wanted to see what would be the result in the George Zimmerman trial. Well, the result is in, not guilty. And to me, the question is not what those six women decided. The question is why we have a legal system that, in my view, allows you to pick a fight, lose that fight, and then shoot the person you're picking a fight with. That seems to me to be the ultimate Florida stand your ground law. So I'm not saying the jury ruled incorrectly according to the law. I'm indicting Florida law because I think that the best, or maybe not best, because I don't think it's a good idea, but perhaps the most logical response to this verdict is for everyone to go around armed and dangerous. And I don't want to live in a country like that. Debating that and many other issues we have tonight is Mike Lane. He's Republican strategist, the president of Intelligent Strategies. Uh, Mike. Let me ask you about specifically Florida Stand Your Ground Law. And I actually have a copy of the jury instructions read to the jury that night. And I want to read to you a little bit from those jury instructions. Maybe we can show them on the screen right here. It says, if George Zimmerman was not engaged in unlawful activity and was attacked in any place we had a right to be, he had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force if he reasonably believed that it was necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or another, or to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. And it goes up, actually, show a little bit above that paragraph if we could, if we could scroll down a bit on the jury instructions. Um, I don't know if we can do that, but what it says in the paragraph before that is that uh, basically it's okay to kill someone, it's legal to kill someone, it's the justifiable use of deadly force if you reasonably believe that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. And you don't have to judge how you got into that mess. In deciding whether George Zimmerman was justified in the use of deadly force, the court read to the jury, you must judge him by the circumstances by which he was surrounded at the time the force was used. So at the time that he shoots, that's the time that matters. Here's how I read these jury instructions. You can go out with your gun. You go out in the middle of the street. And you find someone you want to pick on. You can shove them. You can hit them. And if they hit you back and start to win the fight, causing great bodily harm to you, you can shoot them and kill them. To me, that's legal under Florida law, and that's bad law. Well, I don't believe that actually is legal under Florida law, Mark. We, could, we can discuss that. But look, self-defense is part of uh, the uh, uh, defense statutes in 50 out of 50 states in the District of Columbia. Florida is not outside the mainstream of what the rest of the United States has. And the most important thing on this is that even though there was a great deal of talk about stand your ground uh, when the uh, incident first happened, uh, in fact, stand your ground was not part of the defense that was offered. It's part stand of those jury instructions. It was part of the jury instructions, but it was not part of the defense. The defense was strictly and totally a, uh, a, um, uh, a self-defense thing. Uh, under Florida law, if you, if you have stand your ground, you, if it applies, you do not go to trial. You have a hearing if you prior, to. if you choose to. And, and, so stand your ground was not part of this trial. Zimmerman did not choose they to exercise. They chose not to do that. Right, right, right. He did not want to do that because presumably they have to testify and he'd get subject to cross-examination and he'd get in further trouble. So I understand what they well, did. Well, I don't think you they can want presume to that. that. Uh, you know, you're, you're, I, you're, you're writing something into the fact that somebody elected not to testify and I think that's anti-American. Uh, I'm writing something in the fact that he elected not to use that strategy. Look, as a juror, you're absolutely right. I am not allowed to take any inferences from the use or non-use of the Fifth Amendment. As a commentator, though, I mean, there's right. a reason we have this protection, and uh, I think that Trayvon, Mar I think that George Zimmerman did not want to um, go and use that stand your ground because I think that he wasn't really standing his ground, at least in terms of uh, the statute. Which, because here's one thing: the stand your ground law, the one that 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 uh, he could have used. 
basically says you can't get yourself in that situation. Right. That's why I, I said that I didn't think that what you were describing was legal under Florida law. But, but, read that the self-defense here. What it says is you can get yourself in a bad situation. It can be entirely your fault. And at that moment, you get in trouble. You can pick a fight and you start losing that fight. You can kill someone. No, you can't. it's not just that you're losing a fight. It's that you fear legitimately that you are in imminent danger of losing your life or in great bodily harm. Not necessarily. It's not that you're just losing the fight. No, no, not, just, not necessarily. If we could scroll up on that uh, to the be very beginning of those jury instructions, if we could. It, it go about, it, it scroll down just a little bit more. Um, it goes on to say justifiable homicide. Stop right there. It says uh, that uh, if you... The, the killing of a human being is justifiable and lawful if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon George Zimmerman. Now, aggravated battery is a felony. So again, you pick a fight, the guy punches you back hard, boom, now you can shoot him. Well, that's, that's an aggravated felony. Uh, that, you know, your interpretation may or may not be accurate. I'm not entirely familiar with Florida law. But let, let me take 30 seconds and explain for our audience something that we both know, but they might not. And that is, how do jury instructions come about in a trial like this? What happens is the defense attorneys and the prosecution attorneys both come up with what they believe should be the jury instructions. They submit them to the judge, and then they argue it out in front of the judge, and the judge decides which of column A from the prosecution and which of column A from the def or column B from the defense is going to go into the ultimate instructions that will go to the jury. And that's how jury instructions that's, are decided. That's true. And the judge decides based on Florida right. law, Florida precedent, Florida statutes, decisions of the Florida Supreme Court. They base it on Florida law. I guarantee you that stand your ground language would not be found uh, in Virginia or Maryland or the District of Columbia because we don't have those laws. Th that, that particular uh, that, paragraph that, that, may not be right. there, yes. So, so let's go through what happened here and what we know and what we don't know. Okay, I don't think it's in dispute what happened just prior to the confrontation. I think what happened during the confrontation is in tremendous dispute. That's where the reasonable doubt comes from. But prior to the confrontation, we hear George Zimmerman on the phone with the police dispatcher, and we hear Trayvon Martin on the phone with a friend of his. All right, here's what's consistent about both men talking long before a trial, long before lawyers, long before testimony and time to practice. Here's what they say. They both say that Zimmerman's chasing Martin. They following, both say not, not chasing, following, 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 following Martin. Uh, Martin puts this creepy, he actually this creepy ass cracker is, ch is chasing me, uh, is following me, excuse me. Uh, Zimmerman says, he's running, I'm following him. All right, we know the police dispatcher told Zimmerman, okay, we don't need you to do that. Go back to your car. Mm -hmm. And he disobeys that order from the well, police that, that, dispatcher. No, no. It was, the, the police are not in, enabled or empowered to give an order to anyone under those circumstances. He disobeys that it, advice. It was a suggestion or advice. Yes, there's not an order. Pre I'd say it was stronger than, than it, it, it well, Whatever you want. It's, it's whatever not an it order. Is, whatever it is, he disobeys that. He, he keeps following him. We know that he says, using expletives that I can't say on TV, uh, blank, he ran away. He was very upset that Martin ran away. So he sees... Trayvon Martin seeing him, he even sees, says at one point in that tape, he's approaching me, he's looking at me, and now he's running away, expletive. Because he doesn't want him to run away. He wants to capture the guy. He wants to get the guy. So I don't think there's any dispute, and you can tell me if you dispute, that before the actual physical confrontation began, we have Zimmerman saying he's following him, Zimmerman saying expletive, he ran, uh, Trayvon Martin ran away, didn't know his name, but expletive, he ran away. These guys look like they're dangerous. He looks like he's up to no good. He's looking into the houses. He, uh, Zimmerman says on that tape, uh, he's got his, meaning Trayvon Martin, he's got his, his hand in his waistband. Of course, George Zimmerman has a gun in his waistband. So it seems to me that uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you have a gun in your waistband, you think every guy's got a gun in his waistband, even though most people don't carry guns there. So he's, he's out to get Trayvon Martin. Martin says this guy is scary. He says, uh, he says I'm scared. He says, he's following me. He's nervous. So one man's motivation, Trayvon Martin's, is to get home with his Skittles and Arizona tea. He's in the halftime of a sporting event and he wants to get the food for his little brother and finish the sporting event. His, his goal, get home. Zimmerman's goal, stop Trayvon Martin. Do you really dispute, before the conflict began, that that was the genesis of this? Uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, you know, 
here, here, I don't dispute that's what George uh, Zimmerman was doing. I really don't have any idea what Trayvon Martin was well, doing. Here's what we there know. was actually no testimony as to what Trayvon Martin was doing, other than from his girlfriend, Jantel, right. who was a totally unbelievable witness and confessed to perjury on the stand. She so we don't know. Perjury. What she said was she made excuse. She what she said was she didn't attend uh, the funeral, uh, and and uh, she she heard, apparently Trayvon's mother was there in the room with her while they were asking her a question, and she didn't mm -hmm. want to admit in front of her mother of Trayvon's mother that she wasn't at the will, funeral. Will, will you, to me, will, that's, that's, right, that's a very you, tiny will, detail. Will, will you just stipulate to the fact that she was the world's worst witness you've ever seen in the criminal trial? You know, you have a young teenager, not the world's worst witness, no. But you have a young teenager uh, who's under tremendous pressure, and I think it, it's not easy to be a good witness, particularly, I mean, you know, she hadn't had any training, anything like that. She said what he said on the phone, and the heart of what he said on the phone did not change in her testimony one bit or the other. You can argue about whether or not she should have told the truth about her attending the funeral or not. To me, that's a very human reaction, not wanting to admit to the mother of a murdered friend of yours that you weren't at the funeral. I, to me, I, I think that's, understandable if not, not something I would do, but uh, the, but the heart of what she said, I think is consistent. She said Trayvon saw him, which Zimmerman said he saw him, that Trayvon was scared, and that Trayvon said basically this creepy ass guy is, is following him. I think, I think most Americans who followed it closely and either watched it day by day or saw the highlights extensively on the news at night, uh, concluded that her testimony was not credible, but most Americans don't count. It was the jury that concluded Absolutely. her testimony Absolutely. was not credible. Well, I don't know. That, I don't think you need to say whether her testimony was credible or not to get to what happened next. I mean, to me, all she really testified to was that he saw Zimmerman, which Zimmerman said to the police, and that he was scared. Mm -hmm. I mean, that he was scared, and that I mean, frankly, I, I don't think she would have used the words creepy ass cracker if those weren't the actual words because it doesn't make Trayvon Martin look very good. No, no, it, so it, so it, to me, I believe that Trayvon Martin said those words. Do you not believe he said those words? That, that's probably not in dispute that she said okay. that, that was. So, so was, I think we can agree he said those words, which, which suggests to me that he's scared of some white dude, not using language that I would use, but he's scared because the guy's white and he's creepy and no, he's following no, him. Mark, he's Hispanic, he's not white. In Trayvon Martin's eyes that night, he didn't go in and give a full, a full, by the way, you, you can be, he's white and Hispanic. You, you can be both, obviously. He's, he's as white and Hispanic as Barack Obama is white and black. Fine. Okay. I'm, I'm fine with that. So we'll refer to Barack no, 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 as I don't, our I don't mean president. half white, half Hispanic. I mean that you can have black Hispanics or white Hispanics, and he's a white Hispanic. They're black Hispanics, too. That's a side issue. Uh, if you want to call in and come on this, I want to give I you a chance to do that. Uh, the toll-free number is 888-48-MARK, 888-488-6275. You can also dial in locally, 571-749-1166. I want to get back to the point, when I come back with Mike Lane, whether Trayvon Martin can stand his ground. She's had more than a dozen fractures. And in the next few years, she faces two major surgeries to strengthen her fragile bones. She's only 10 years old. Most people don't worry about fragile bones until late in life. For those with osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bones are a concern throughout their lifetime. Find out how you can strengthen this child's future. Diabetes is a killer. After I was diagnosed, I didn't feel sick, so I didn't listen to my doctor. Then it struck. I had a heart attack, then a stroke, and I was only 49. Most people with diabetes also have high blood pressure and cholesterol, which can cause severe heart damage. In fact, two out of three people with diabetes die from heart disease or stroke. Don't let diabetes destroy your life. Call for your free diabetes survival guide. Choose to live.
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. So when an armed man shoots and kills an unarmed teenager, I think you can understand why people are upset, particularly when the armed guy profiles the unarmed teenager and basically says, looks like he doesn't have a right to be here. Turns out Trayvon Martin had every right to be there as George Zimmerman. In fact, neither of them lived there. They both lived, uh, Zimmerman lived in his fiance's apartment and, and Trayvon Martin was with his father's girlfriend's apartment. They both had a right to be there, an equal right to be there. So when two people have an equal right to be in the same place, the question is what happens when one has a gun and one does not? I want you to take Mike, the, this is Mike Lane, of course, President of Telephone Strategies, Republican Strategies. I want you to take the exact same jury instruction that we just read mm -hmm. and change the names. And I'm going to read it again with, with the name, one name changed. If Trayvon Martin was not engaged in unlawful activity, and remember, he's carrying skibbles back to his, to his little brother, and was attacked in any place where he had a right to be, he had a clear right to be there, he had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force, if he reasonably believed that it was necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or another, or to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. Take the exact same scenario, well, let's give Trayvon the gun. Okay. Trayvon has a gun, George Zimmerman does not. George Zimmerman comes up to him and says, hey buddy, what are you doing here? Takes a swing at him, Trayvon Martin, Fights back, they get in a fight, Trayvon starts losing, and he shoots George Zimmerman. Would you agree in that case that George, that in that case, Trayvon Martin would be not guilty of murder based on self-defense? Absolutely. You would? Absolutely. Okay. Do you think, in such a case, if an unarmed night watchman went after a black kid with a gun, do you sincerely believe that a jury would have found Trayvon Martin not guilty? Uh, given the facts of the case, if they unloaded as, as this one uh, unloaded on the jury, then I would think they would, yeah. See, here's the, here's the problem. What this is saying, basically, is two guys get in a fight, whoever has the gun gets to kill, and they don't go to jail. I don't No, Mark, there has to be reason to think that you are in imminent danger of death or se severe bodily harm. It's not, you know, it's not just because I'm in a fight. You have to think that you're about to die or sustain severe bodily harm. And are you okay with that even if you begin the fight? Yeah, I am. So you begin a fight, you, 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 I mean, you, you throw the first punch, you're a bad guy, you're, I mean, you're looking for trouble, you have a gun, you throw the first punch, and then you start losing the fight. If you win the fight, you just punch the guy. But if you start losing the fight, then you can shoot him. I mean, I have a real problem with that you know, kind of law. To it's, me, it's, let me give you an example of why you, I have a problem with it, okay? I'm going to give you another manslaughter one. This one's clear. This one's very easy in the law to apply. You drink and you drive. You get really drunk, okay? And you try to drive home. Your goal is to get home. Your goal is not to kill anyone, but you drank too much. And you stupidly got behind the, the wheels of the car. And somebody gets in front of your car and you kill them. You don't mean to kill them, but you do. You can be charged, and should be charged in my view, with manslaughter. Not murder, but manslaughter. You intentionally committed a reckless act, and that reckless act led to an innocent person's death. In my view, George Zimmerman intentionally committed a reckless act by going around with a gun, refusing to wait for the police, refusing to go back to his car, and chasing this guy. And that led to a series of events that led to an unarmed teenager's death. Now, I admit I don't know what happened that night, after the phone calls were done. You don't know, I don't know. The jury is supposed to find a reasonable doubt on behalf of the criminal defendant. That's why I understand why they ruled the way they did. Okay, if Trayvon Martin had won the fight, the exact same fight, I don't know. I would hope that maybe they'd find a reasonable doubt for him. I would think they would. But, but I mean, in essence, if, what we're saying is, if two guys get in a fight, you better win and you better kill the guy, because if you don't kill them, they no, can testify. No, I think, look, you know, the first thing- Zimmerman started this. I mean, and he, to me, he should at least be culpable for starting it, just like the drunk driver. Look, Not murder. They both, they, they both made decisions that if they had gone differently, this whole tragedy would have been avoided. We don't know for a fact that Trayvon well, Martin made any decision that was well, in any way wrong. Well, okay. 
uh, had he just run all the way home and up on the front steps he of the house to which home. he was... He, 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 they, they said that know. the homes looked alike. He had only been there a week. That he, could, he was looking up, trying to figure out which, which one was it. I think that's what his friend testified right, to. Right, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm not putting a lot of credibility in what... I uh, guess he could run uh, out in the street. Uh, you know, they both had the opportunity to avoid this tragic circumstance. I'll, I'll concede to you... Zimmerman had the first opportunity to avoid this tragic circumstance he started it. and had multiple opportunities to avoid it after that. Trayvon Martin had opportunities to avoid this tragic circumstance. But as we understand it, you know, the, the circumstances were uh, at least the only testimony introduced into the trial, and it was introduced by the prosecution when they played the Zimmerman tapes, was that Trayvon Martin threw the first punch. Uh, and after, uh, you know, yeah, that's, after what, that's that, what Zimmerman very self-servicely testified the, the, the to. I'm no, quite no, confident. He didn't testify. He gave an he gave interview to, to the police. And, 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 I'm and, quite and the prosecution introduced right. that, that interview into evidence. And what was on their mind? I, oh, that was really stupid. That was really <laughs> dumb. <laughs> I, I concede that. I absolutely concede that. If the guy's not going to take the stand, don't let him testify through your own case. Okay, that so, was a ridiculous tactic by the so prosecution. So you'll, you'll, you'll concede uh, with me that Angela Corey ought to go into wills and estates and just uh, call it a career? I, I concede to you the prosecution presented a lousy case, I, I present the, which is why I don't blame the jury. But I still feel, this is the heart of my issue, and it goes beyond this case. It seems to me that George Zimmerman is morally culpable for the actions that night that he was the instigator, he started it. Frankly, I'm not so sure Trayvon Martin could have avoided it. Maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. I, I have a reasonable doubt one way or the other on that. I have no reasonable doubt that George Zimmerman started this conflict. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't know that, I don't think he intended to kill uh, Trayvon Martin from the beginning, no. any more than a drunk driver intends to kill someone with their car. But when you drink and drive and kill someone, you have, done a reckless act that led to an innocent person's death and you are punished. You're not punished with 25 years in prison, but you're punished with a year or two in prison. In my mind, there should be a law, and I think it should be the manslaughter law, but we could make up another law. There should be a law that says if you pick a fight, even if you start losing it, even if you have a right to use it in self-defense, even if all that's true and we can't know and we have to give you reasonable doubt, the mere fact that you picked and started a fight that led to someone, a complete stranger dying, you should be punished. That should be punished in our society. Can we agree on that? I'll, I'll talk about it and figure out what the details are. The devil's in the details. I agree you should not be uh, a physical aggressor on someone. Put yourself in a situation where you can then argue that, that uh, lethal force is necessary and then use it. That, that's obviously and, and, and let me suggest something further. But, but yeah. you know, it, we, have to, we have to negotiate right, the details right, okay. of what right, you're I'm, proposing. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but let me suggest something further. If George Zimmerman had not had a gun on him that night. Uh, no doubt we would have come up with a couple of bruised bodies. But, um, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't think it's clear that George Zimmerman wouldn't have been dead. Oh, so you think uh, Trayvon Martin would, would, would have, well. I don't know, but I don't, I don't think we can conclude one way or the this? other that George if, Zimmerman if he would not have been dead. had a gun that night. I mean, the testimony was that Trayvon Martin told him he was going to die that night. This is your last night. This is Zimmerman's right. uh, but, you know, extremely self-serving testimony. Again, to me, that, int that, introduced by the prosecution. Well, okay. And we agree that was silly. But, but uh, stupid. I mean, really bad. My point is, though, that if we had a law, like the law in D.C., that says you have, you have a right to your gun in your own home for self-defense, which I understand the Supreme Court made them say it. But okay, that's the law but, in but, D.C. But they don't do. Uh, <laughs> you still can't do it you, in D.C. But it seems to me the only people who should be carrying guns on the streets are police officers, military, trained, licensed and trained security guards, and on your way hunting. Only you really don't need the streets. You have it in your car. Walking around on the streets with a gun it seems to me you're much more likely to get into exactly the situation. If Zimmerman hadn't had a gun, he might have stayed in his car that night and let the police do the job. That's their job. Right. I don't want armed vigilantes roaming our streets. We don't know that. No, I don't want armed vigilantes roaming the streets, but I certainly am not going to have anybody take, a, take away my right to carry a, a weapon for self-defense purposes. Uh, on your person? It? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, absolutely. the other thing also is you're an ex-Marine, so you've had some training in it. I actually have much less problem with you. I have a problem with un How about this? What if we require, we're going to get to the abortion language in a minute, where they're putting all these, what I think, unnecessary restrictions on abortion providers. But let's put a, a restriction on gun owners. You have to be licensed and trained to carry a firearm. You have to be licensed to you drive know, a car. You know what? If you're going to carry it on the streets, 
You need to pass a test about ethics and about starting fights. And, and I'm even going to hold you to a higher standard. If you're carrying a gun on the streets and you start a fight, minimum one year jail time. You know what? How about here's, that? Here's the deal. I, you, you, you start a fight. Your analogy between cars and guns is apples and oranges. Driving a car is a privilege granted so to you by the state. Uh, owning a firearm is a right granted to you by the Constitution. Well, you know, so you know, we disagree on that. Right. I, in my view, it's only if you're in the militia. Um, but uh, now, but, but let me get let me get to your other point, which is that you know, in in Virginia, uh, where we are, you can open carry, and you know, it, as long as it's visible, you anybody training whatever can have a, uh, a firearm on their it hip. Had it been visible uh, on their hip, and you can open carry. Well, it, it may or may not have been visible. We don't. It's dark out. Nobody, it'll be nobody interesting knew. to know whether that would have. Uh, but if you want to have a concealed carry permit in the state of Virginia, and presumably in some other states as well, you do have to have the safety and, and uh, uh, proficiency training that you're talking about. Well, I, you think cannot, you to, I think you should have to have it anytime you carry something capable of killing someone. The real tragedy in Trayvon Martin's case, obviously, is that he wasn't carrying a gun, uh, because then he could have shot Zimmerman safely. But that's well, not a tragedy I don't, at all. I don't, I don't know That's that, a heart. You know, uh, there would have to be evidence that Trayvon Martin feared uh, for imminent danger of his life and or uh, severe bodily harm. And, and I don't know that we had any evidence in the trial about that. You know, uh, it, it's not hard if you shoot someone to walk into a tree and cause enough damage. I mean, according to the mm -hmm. prosecution, the wounds were minor. They were the kind of scratches you see on a playground. Uh, it's very easy to get a lot of blood on your face if, uh, from, one, from one scratch. I know I've, I've had a scratch on my finger and it's bled all over the place. So that's not that hard to do. In any case, I do understand our criminal defense system. I understand you give the reasonable doubt to a criminal defendant. Absolutely. My fear is that this case will encourage a lot more people to be armed vigilantes, to carry weapons and to go out and look for trouble. And I don't want that in this well, country. And I fear we don't, no, we don't a lot want more that. people will die we don't because want that. of this case. No, we, we don't we want really do. armed vigilantes out there. Uh, we don't want vigilantes armed or unarmed. You know, I mean, we want people who are law-abiding citizens. And if you carry a uh, firearm for self-defense, uh, that's a constitutional right. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. But we, we can argue that another time. Uh, I, this, happen, I happen to have the Supreme Court is, on my side. Wrong, wrong by, as you by think one vote, By one vote. <laughs> by one vote that can change if we get rid of the filibuster, which we'll talk about uh, later on in this segment. Right. Uh, when we come back, I want to talk about abortion laws, because it seems to me that just as Republicans are making it easy as pie to carry guns wherever you want and to attack unarmed teenagers, they're making it very, very hard for the other constitutional right, this one I think you disagree with, which is the right of a woman to choose to have an abortion. And the restrictions are so large, and they're going on all across the country, in about 20 states. Many people know about Wendy Davis uh, giving the filibuster in Texas, which eventually, of course, they passed anyway, despite her. But it's not just Texas. It's North Dakota. It's Missouri. It's states all across the nation. And it seems to me striking that the same legislatures that won't allow food for poor people are requiring poor women to have babies. But we'll talk about that when we come back. If you want to call in, it's 888-488-MARK. I want to hear from you. We'll be right back after this. Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact CFRIP at AOL.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. 
and may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I am Mark Levine talking about all kinds of things, uh, the Zimmerman trial, but I do want to move on at some point and talk about the Republican attempts to uh, restrict abortion rights and also to end food stamps. Pretty amazing stuff. We're going to get to that in just a second. First, I want to get to a caller because, after all, we do want to take your calls at 888-488-MARK or 571-749-1166. Marvin, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Thank you for I calling. I to you every day. Okay, what's your question or comment? My question is, why isn't anybody really paying attention to what is really happening in the White House? What do you mean by that? All the scandals and seem to not be getting talked about right now because of all the Trayvon Martin How, what, case going on. What does the White House have to do with Trayvon Martin, in your view? Hello? Yeah, no, you just said the scandals in the White House having to do with Trayvon Martin. There's lots of things in the White House, and there's lots of things with Trayvon Martin. I'm not sure I see the connection, but what do you see? I think it's just to divert our attention from all the scandals that Obama and Holder and you maybe even the president of the United States, Hillary Clinton, that Wait. are dodging. Okay, so you think the media is trying to divert attention from Obama, or do you think the White House has caused this trial? Let me say something. No, I, uh, go ahead, one last point. Just like you right now are trying to divert the attention of the American people. I'm not trying to divert either. Frankly, I'm about to move on to talk about abortion laws all across the country and the food stamp bill in the United States Congress. And if I have time, I want to talk about the filibuster and McDonald and immigration and everything. Uh, but I appreciate your call. Uh, I mean, I, I think Mike may even agree with me on this. Um, you can blame Obama for lots of things, but I don't think you can blame him for either the Trayvon Martin trial or the attention to it. You have a case involving race and guns, and yeah, people think, are going to watch. I, I think Marvin's half right, though. I think that you know, even though I'm not going to point the finger at the administration for uh, creating the diversion of the Martin trial to get the scandals off the front page, the fact of the matter is the scandals have not been on the front page. You've got the IRS, you've got the AP, you've got Fox News. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Benghazi, uh, you've got Fast and Furious, and they have not received the attention that they should. Not, I don't think, because the White House invented the Trayvon Martin, uh, uh, George Zimmerman trial, but because the press is in cahoots with the administration to keep them off the front page. I think page. the press always uh, takes the most sensational best story that gets the most eyes, and people want to talk about Benghazi's Zimmerman's trial. Benghazi's pretty sensational. Well, I'll tell you about the IRS. Right. I'll tell you something sensational came out about that, uh, that uh, there's no scandal at all. Turns out that uh, Congress, the, that Daryl Issa did not want to release the tapes of their investigation. Mm -hmm. Well, the tapes show, guess what? They went after Tea Party groups. They went after progressive groups. Right, they went they after... They went after all political groups as they're required to do by law. No scandal whatsoever. They went, Oops. They went after 77 uh, conservative groups and seven uh, progressive there groups. There you go. There were many more conservative groups in 2010 you know. than, than, well, than uh, it's, it's, that it's, it's still an absolute scandal. Even if they're going after progressive groups, that's an absolute scandal. It's not. That's what 501c4 is all about. It no, says no. you're not Mark. allowed to be. Mark. Up, you have to be primarily. You, are not, you have to be exclusively social welfare. Let, let, let me take the most egregious example that I've heard of to date. One group was asked, not only did they have a prayer to open their meeting, but did they, ha you know, would they please supply the content of what those prayers were? Okay, I'm that, opposed to that is question. egregious. I'm opposed to that que specific question, but the idea that you cannot have tax-exempt anonymous donors giving to political organizations, that's the law. If you don't like the law, change it. It's been around more than 100 years. That's what the IRS was trying to enforce without much guidance. But uh, and 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 they and they they went a little off. But they they were basically going right. against everybody. So let me get back to the points that I wanted to talk about today because I think that's old news. I don't think people care about that anymore. Although Unfortunately, until we get Martin does. until we get to Martin the, does. Uh, until we get to the bottom of it, I think we should care. But I'll uh, let you move all on. All right, all right. Let's talk about the abortion bills because all across the country, uh, Texas got a lot of attention. But it's not just Texas. Their bills, uh, most famously in Virginia, of course, was the bill by the Republicans in Virginia to require women to have a transvaginal ultrasound, to literally stick a device inside a woman against her will 
if she wanted to have an abortion. Now that one was finally, after a huge uproar, uh, changed into a, Mark, a body. Do ultrasound. you know how a surgical abortion takes place? Well, you know what? That's consensual. There's a huge difference between a woman having something enter her that's consensual and non-consensual, and I'm sure you can agree on that. Okay, we're talking about you know medical procedures, though. So right, go on. right. But anytime the government is requiring medical procedures on women who don't want them. I'm suspicious. And there's a whole host of restrictions. There's restrictions for late-term abortions, uh, including some where the, you, you know there's traumatic danger to the woman. Uh, there's restrictions on uh, fetal abnormalities. I mean, you think about it, uh, you know, you can have some uh, uh, fetus with a uh, chromosomal deficit that causes them to die within two or three years. And you're saying, no, we want to force you to have a child that's going to die in two years. Uh, here's what strikes me about all of this. At the same time as Republicans are forcing, let's face it, mostly poor women, mostly a lot of black women, a lot of people who can't afford to have babies, forcing young children to have babies, all of this at the same time as they're denying them food stamps, $4.50 a day. This idea that save the fetus but let the child starve, I, I can't wrap my mind around well, it. I, I, I think you're you know, conflating two things that don't equate. But let's talk first about the abortion thing. We can go to uh, food stamps at whatever point you uh, um, want to talk about it. Look, most Americans, the, the polls are anywhere between 60 and 70 percent of Americans oppose Gosnell-style late-term abortions. Uh, 60 percent or more of Americans want a ban on abortions after the 20th week. Uh, it's, there's nothing that you're talking about that can't be discovered in the first 20 weeks. And when you start doing it after the 20th week, it really becomes a very Gosnell-style gruesome situation. And that's what Texas is all about. That's what North Carolina, or excuse me, North Dakota was all about. And there's even a federal bill that we talked about off air uh, that, as you point out, is probably not going to uh, receive consideration in the Senate. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what the current uh, crop of abortion legislation addresses is the late term and the Americans support a ban on that. Well, they also, uh, frankly, well, okay, let's talk about late term, and then I want to get to the fact that they're basically banning clinics all across the nation. I mean, Texas had to go down from 200 clinics to about six in a very, very large state. We'll get to that in a second. But late term abortions, I actually think there's room for compromise here. Late term abortions are more gruesome than early term abortions, and they're very rare. I'm sure you know the vast majority, far more than 90% of abortions, occur in the first trimester. Late-term abortions generally occur when there's a problem, when there's a fetal abnormality, when the mother's health is in danger, when something has gone dreadfully wrong. And in that case, I want the doctor and the woman to make that decision. I don't believe the government should be saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're required to have a child with a fetal abnormality to my, or, or something that's of danger to a woman's health. To, to my understanding, the uh, health of the mother uh, exemption is part of all the legislation it's that has passed. Uh, Supreme all Court them. rulings. The constitutional but, but, really, but it's part of the state legislation. I do, I do not believe over. it is. Uh, some of them have life of the mother, but I, uh, seen I, I know for a fact Texas has life of the mother as life, but of, not health. And there's uh, a difference. I mean, if you if you if having this child means you can never have a child again, or you're going to have uh, severe damage to the mother's body. I mean, we just talked about the fact that you could kill someone if you if if uh, if uh, someone's coming after you with great bodily harm. But apparently, you can't have an abortion if that's going to cause you great bodily harm. All right, so let me, let me get this straight. Uh, what you're telling me is that if we can agree on what the reasonable exceptions to it should be, you'll go along with a 20th week uh, I would go along with 20th week, but I would go along with last trimester. Uh, I would go along with, so that's about 27. 24 week. 12, 27. 27. I mean, 40 right. weeks divided by, by three. Uh, I think actually most Democrats would too. Barney Frank, my boss, I don't know if you know this, we worked on late-term abortion bill, and every time Barney Frank put in life or health of the mother exception, and he was willing to go further than some Democrats are, he was willing to say health is not mental health, but physical harm mm -hmm. uh, to the mother. Uh, because I, I know of people who have had, uh, I know of cases of people who have had late-term abortions, and every single one that I know of involved some dramatic fetal abnormality. I would also include a dramatic fetal abnormality. So either great bodily harm to the mother or a fetal, a severe fetal abnormality, something like a baby born without a spine or, uh, you know, a, a babies born with Tay-Sachs tend to die within two or three years. They never live past the age of four, something like that. Uh, not, you know, a sixth toe or something like that. All right, I'll tell you what. I think, I think we could probably come up with a list that you and I could agree with. Okay. You want 27, I want 20, meet me at 24. 
uh, with with these exceptions. Fetal yeah, abnormality. Yeah, as I said, we'll we'll life, we'll, life we'll, we'll work the on mother. the list of exceptions. Life and health of the mother, because it, it's okay. it, those, that's when the vast majority of late term abortions occur, and there are very few of them, and the, and most the vast majority of them involve some very very severe things. So all right, maybe we can come to some agreement there. Here's the thing that I'll never agree on: the Republicans won't even pass food stamps. You know, I, I love when no. Republicans complain, all these poor people taking all this money from, from food stamps. The average food stamp, I looked it up, all across the country, and it differs from state to state, but the average is $4.50 a day. And I dare say, Mike Lane, if you try to eat on 30 bucks a week, that's really hard to do. I, I said, try to do that. I mean, I guess you could have pasta and cereal. I don't know. No, maybe you, not certainly, cereal. you certainly couldn't afford McDonald's. Uh, no, you couldn't afford McDonald's? I don't think you could afford much of anything at all. I don't think it's actually possible. I think you to could survive. do pasta. Uh, pasta, pasta, pasta and every, marinara sauce. Every, every day. Every day for, for a week or two weeks or so forth. It's a tiny bit of money. Okay. And this idea that here's, Republicans are going to support no, no, massive agricultural subsidies, which you and I have come out against, Big money to agribusinesses, but they're not willing to give four dollars a day to a starving child. To me, no, no. strikes me. It's, it's, it's actually it's showing exactly what the Republican. But, but that's, that's that's actually not what the issue is about, Mark. The issue is about the exploding um, budget and and driving the deficit on food stamps. The latest figures food are food stamps is not part of the exploding budget. It, it actually is. If if you look at the statistics that were released by the president uh, just this last week, more people are using. Uh, them. We now have. 103 million Americans on food assistance right. and only 97 million Americans employed full time. Something's going dreadfully in the wrong direction. We have to find ways to get people off food stamps, get the economy reinvigorated, get them jobs, and and stop uh, the you know the uh, welfare state as See, Obama this, wants this to build is so it. So striking to me. We look, a Democrat and a Republican, we look at a third of America so poor they can't afford to eat without $4 a day. And the Democratic solution is feed people, don't let them starve. The Republican solution is one third of Americans. Uh, no. our, our solution is to give them decent jobs with decent wages, decent health care, and decent food. Your solution is, oh my God, a third of the people are so poor. No. Take Mark, away their food. You actually had it right the first time. Your solution is to just give them food. Our That's right. Our, I don't want people starving. Our, our solution is to get them jobs and let them let them be able to support themselves. Let them have the dignity of a good paying but you don't job want them to have and self worth good associated job. with it. You're, you're the group that supports Walmart coming in and paying less than minimum wage. You're the group that supports paying undocumented immigrants less than minimum wage. We want to pay them a decent wage they can survive on. The reason I they need food stamps is because of the Republican economy. I don't. I don't think we we. I don't think you'll find anybody who supports paying anybody less than the minimum wage, that would be a crime. Republicans are for law and order. Republicans are for abolishing the minimum wage. Are you? Uh, I, I actually think that a market wage works better than a minimum wage, yes. So you, it, you're, it, it you're for people... making it legal to pay below minimum wage. That's what no, no, no. As long as there's a minimum wage, everybody's going to make at least that much. That's true. How about and this... I support how that. About, how about D.C.'s super minimum wage? I support that, Another too. night. I support that, too. <laughs> you want to call in? 888-488-MARK. We'll be right back right after this. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about me. Nothing very nice. I'm a homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go? to protect the planet. I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, 
helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. I'm arguing with Mike Lane, Republican strategist, over the issues of the day. Uh, now, as Mike knows, as you may not know, this is, of course, the Inside Scoop from Washington, but technically our studios are across the river in Virginia. And in Virginia, we have a governor that really likes to get money from his friends and various corporations. His wife likes the money. His kids like the money. He's gotten at least $120,000. It's looking closer to $200,000. And the scariest thing about this is it might just be legal. Apparently, Virginia, you can pay off the governor, bribe him as much as you want, as long as he discloses it. Except McDonald didn't disclose it. The vast majority of things are just coming to light now, and people are starting to talk about impeachment. It seems to me that if he broke the law, he should be impeached. But even if he didn't break the law, this is highly unethical, immoral behavior. You know, Mark, there's a lot of smoke. I'll grant you that. Um, so far, there's no fire. Uh, there is uh, nothing that I've seen uh, in all the leaks that have come out of the uh, Justice Department uh, that indicate uh, there's any crime that's been committed. Uh, that indicates- $120,000 given to Mrs. McDonald. Explain that, please. Uh, I, actually, it was $50,000 to and Mrs. 70, McDonald and 70000 to a corporation uh, called Mobo uh, Real Estate Properties. Uh, and uh, there's no requirement that that be disclosed. Uh, there's a, an agreement that it is to be paid back on certain terms, which I will grant are extraordinarily favorable to the uh, recipient of the loan. But there's no requirement under state law that any of this be disclosed. Uh, because you know, it's a loan, not a gift. Uh, because it's a loan and because it's a loan to a corporation and, you know, not Owned uh, by? The governor and his sister. Exactly. Right. But, but there's, look, let me go on to step two. I agree. The law needs to be updated. It ought to be required that a loan such as that be fully disclosed, uh, all terms and conditions, et cetera. But it's not now. So, so far, we still see smoke, but there's no fire. You know, I seem to recall, and I've, I've been uh, arguing with you for some time, but I didn't argue with you back in the 90s. And in the 90s, of course, mm -hmm. it was made a huge deal out of Whitewater. The irony about Whitewater was it was all disclosed, and the Clintons lost money. This is very different. In this case, McDonnell and his wife and his sister and his kids are all getting vast amounts of sums. I haven't seen any evidence any of it has been paid back. Uh, maybe now that it's been disclosed. No, no, no. The, the, the only one that needs to be paid back is the, I, I, I understand, is the $70,000 loan to Mobo uh, Real Estate Properties uh, LLC. And the terms and conditions require that to be paid, as I understand it, back in 2015. So nothing's been paid back yet. Uh, at, at very favorable terms. Uh, Look, uh, yes, at, at extraordinarily this. favorable Why terms. Why are people... F terms almost as favorable as Jim Moran got his, uh, his home mortgage from, uh, uh, you know, the friends of... Uh, what's Tell his me name? this. Why are people giving very, very favorable loans and grants and gifts? I mean, paying for the daughter's wedding, that wasn't a loan, right? The guy just said, hey, I'd love to give you $15,000 for your daughter's wedding. That was a, no, no, he didn't give it to the governor and he didn't give it to the governor's wife. He gave it to the daughter to pay the catering bill. To the daughter to pay the catering Or actually, bill. he gave it to the caterer Although, you know, to pay the catering bill. I don't bill. know. By tradition, most weddings are paid for by parents anyway, usually by yes. the bride's parents. In this case, it would be the governor and his wife. In any case, the McDonald family saved $15,000. Now, do and, you think... And that should have been disclosed. It should require that it be disclosed, even though it was not... Dis you know, even though there is no current legal requirement that it be disclosed, uh, they should have exercised proper discretion and disclosed it anyway. Would an ethical governor do this? Uh, you know, I think that uh, there are, there's a lot of smoke, there's no fire. Uh, no, wait, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute. If I a Democrat that... were receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars from political donors who have business in the state house, you would be railing up and down, jumping down in this chair. You I couldn't think, restrain yourself. I, I, think, I think the governor owes a complete and thorough explanation to the people of Virginia press as conference. to what's going on. You and I both support a full press conference where McDonald answers every single question about these. You know what? More than right. a press conference. Let's do it under oath. Let's have a full hearing uh, under oath before the Virginia legislature. I have absolutely no problem with that, but there is one minor glitch that you're going to say, smokescreen, but it's not. 
you never comment on an investigation while it's in progress. And the investigation is in progress. As soon as they conclude what they're doing, I agree with you. You think will be a, indicted? A full, I do not think, well, well, based on what we know now, there's nothing to indict for. If there's stuff back there that they've hey, learned the that we I uh, don't, don't believe, know about. I believe that you can hold the governor of a state to a higher standard. And I do not believe you have to find, frankly, even a crime to say that the, the evidence, the behavior is unethical and the man needs to be removed from office. Look, well, that would be impeachment. Right. That, that would be impeachment. It's not going to happen. And, and I understand well, Republicans I mean, the, control the, the, Virginia. The, no, no, but the General Assembly is not in session, and they're not going to come back into session until three days before he leaves office and the next governor comes in. Well, I, so, I, I, you you know, know. I actually think you don't think the Virginia uh, Assembly could call an impeachment session? But they're not going to, as you pointed out. They're not going to for political reasons. They're not going to because it's controlled by Republicans. Let me suggest no. to you I, I actually that believe your party needs to throw McDonnell off the bus or you're going to lose the Virginia elections this November because people will see that the Virginia Republican Party is corrupt, led by a corrupt government. Well, I, I actually don't think that. People know that uh, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, the, the Republican candidate for governor this year, and Governor McDonald have always had something of a frosty relationship. They're not close. They're not friends. They're not political allies. Uh, I don't think this rubs off on the governor's race at all. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? What should people do? I mean, are you willing to call for the governor's no, resignation? I, no, I'm, I'm willing to say that when this, the day after this uh, investigation is concluded, uh, that the governor needs to hold a press conference and or testify in front of the General Assembly, whatever, you know, uh, uh, is appropriate. And if he does and, not. And needs to answer the appropriate questions for the people of Virginia. And if he cannot answer them, he should resign. If he doesn't have reasonable, legitimate uh, answers, all of which are legal and ethical, then what, yes, I what, don't believe he should continue. What could be reasonable, and again, we agree the law is flawed, what could be ethical about accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars from people who do business in the state house? Do you really think these gifts are because think, they, they, I, I love, think, they love the governor's daughter, I, I don't think, was, they're this really guy's, close? This, this guy's name is Johnny Williams or whatever his name Johnny is. Williams, Johnny Williams. Yeah. I, you know, there there's is, more than Johnny Williams. Th though. That's, but, but here's the thing. There's a whole bunch of people there's, giving gifts to the governor, there's no, his wife and his children. Um, well, if they're gifts to the governor, then they've been disclosed. Uh, if they're gifts to the family, uh, as we both have pointed That's out. Where you know, the, the, That's where it comes from. That's where they give The law needs to be changed to update and say that immediate family gifts need to be disclosed. Right. And there's no legitimate purpose for a governor of a state to take undisclosed gifts for him or his family, whether legal or not. Well, I don't think... No, gov again, no governor again, there's, of there's, any state, again, there's no, no president, no member of Congress. Again, there's no allegations that, that anything went to the governor. But here's, here's the key mark. Wait, 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 wait. Come on. When, when you pay for his daughter's wedding, are you really going to say with a straight face, that didn't accrue as a benefit to the governor? One of the things that I think they need to explain, uh, and, and they need to explain fairly completely, is what exactly is Mr. Williams' relationship with the daughter, and did he have an independent friendship with her, and, and therefore it would be justifiable as a wedding gift to her? I think that that's one of the questions that needs to be asked. You know, I, I don't know about you, Mike, I'm not aware very often of friends uh, particularly the ones that aren't marrying the girl, uh, out paying for the entire catering bill. Those, those, are, those are very Mark, generous you, you, friends. Mark, you and I have the wrong friends. We should uh, have uh, friends clearly, that generous. Clearly, clearly. Or we should get higher levels of politics where people understand a little quid pro quo and how it works. I don't like that. Uh, let me ask you about something else. Uh, Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell were, uh, it wasn't quite the caning that occurred in the 19th century, but it, it, verbally it was close. I forget McConnell called Reed, the worst one ever. And you and I have argued now for, oh, what, at least eight years, I think? Something like that, seven, eight years. Uh, and I remember a time back in the Bush years when I was arguing for a filibuster. So I, I want to point out where I still think I'm consistent because I, I'm not so sure you are, but you can tell me where you are. I have long argued that filibustering a judicial nominee should be allowed. And the reason is this. A, a, you appoint a judge, the judge is appointed for life. That judge lasts long after the president is gone who appointed him or her. And to me, requiring 60 votes for someone who's supposed to apply the law fairly, someone who's a referee, that actually seems fair to me. I'm okay with filibustering judges and justices. I am not okay with filibustering a presidential appointee to serve him or her. You know, if, if the person is so corrupt, I believe in advising consent, I'm not knocking out the Constitution. If the person is so corrupt or they're drunk or they're on drugs or they're, that, that they can't get 50 votes, okay, well then you, you can't, you can't uh, approve that person. That's what advice and consent is about. But this extra 60 votes, there's been, I looked it up, there's been 36 filibusters of presidential nominees in all of American history, and 16 of them, or almost half, have been for Barack Obama. And let me suggest to you why 
the Republicans are doing it. They're not doing it because they hate Richard Cordray. They're not doing it because they hate the specific person that Barack Obama has nominated to the Federal Election Board or the National Labor Relations Board. They're doing it because they hate the law. They don't want unions, so they won't want the National Labor Relations Board to function. They don't want election regulations. They don't want uh, financial services and Wall Street regulations. They don't want these bills. So instead of winning on the ground, they've lost these are law, and now they're trying to stop implementing the law by not allowing the president to appoint the person of his choice. To me, this is wrong, and if the Republicans keep it up, Harry Reid is right to end the filibuster on presidential nominees. All right. Um, let's see if I'm consistent with what I've said over the years. All right. Fair enough. I believe, in general, uh, presidents ought to be able to get an up or down vote on their uh, nominees. Uh, and, it would so only be, on and it would only be extreme circumstances uh, that would justify a filibuster. Uh, there are apparently seven uh, nominees uh, at this point that uh, Harry Reid is going apoplectic over, that he wants uh, Republican agreement to cave and let them in, in which case he will not blow the Senate up with the nuclear option. Uh, four of them are non-starters. Uh, and so I believe that we're going to have the three relatively minor. Give me the four non-starters. Let's go uh, right yeah, to the nuclear. Yeah, the, the, we only got two minutes. Okay, the, the three relatively non-important, you know, national labor relations ones. These are people who were illegally appointed to the national labor relations boards. They they knowingly took that seat illegally. They sat there and they participated in decisions. The Supreme Court threw them out and said, "No, you are illegal sitting there. We are not going to then go back and confirm people who who committed that illegal act." They the were Supreme only Court illegal them, because the Senate violated the Constitution by not giving an up or down vote on these the, nominations. No, no, no. They were, illegal, they, they were illegal because they were, they were recess they were appointments when, they there was, when there was no recess. Why were they recess? There because was no the recess. Republicans refused to allow... Right. And, let me, is this a legitimate tactic? If you don't like a law, refuse to appoint anyone to the bench. The Republicans... Is that, is that a legitimate tactic? Uh, if you don't like a law, refuse to allow the president to enforce the well, law? Well, that, that, that's the consumer uh, uh, situation. That, that's it's also where the it National Labor Relations Board. No, no, no. Republicans no, no. hate no. the National Labor Relations Board because right. it allows unions to occur. They it allows people to get off food stamps. They don't want that. They don't want people to have the food stamps or the living wage. Re Republican leader McConnell has offered Democratic leader Bur uh, Bird, uh, uh, Reed. He is, a, he is a bird, but uh, Reed, uh, the opportunity that if Mr. Obama will withdraw the three people who served illegally for a year and submit just three additional nominations, it doesn't matter who they are, they will let them through. And, they will actually and, and let him to have a full National Labor Relations Board, were, Consumer Protection, and Federal Election no, We're just talking about the three for the National Labor Relations Board now. They said if they'll withdraw the three people who served illegally and, and took this uh, they thing served and, and serve, they did serve, the Supreme Court said they served illegally. And nominate, and nominate, no, right, District Court of Appeals. Appeals. Close enough. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, and submit three more, the Republicans will vote them in. That's what they said, I, and Reid said no, and Obama said no. Our time is up, but I think at least we both agree that you should have an up or down vote on presidential nominees that are not like serving, and a filibuster for those that are. Can we agree on that? Uh, you'll never be able to. Uh, you know, I can't I, I want, no, no. I want to. I want to he maintain. Wants to think about I want to make. No, I want to well, maintain the up. right for particularly egregious, out of the mainstream people our, like Cordray. Our, our, our time's up. Thank you, my friend, for coming on the show.